sequence why anything but with my guest Asha Divos uh, at the Galadari Hotel where you can experience a new dimension in hospitality. Asha, the marine biologist and the ocean educator. Ocean educator? That's a title I made for myself. Oh, okay. Um, of course, as one does. Um, because uh, as much as I'm passionate about the science and the research and discovering things, um, I'm probably equally or more passionate about actually sharing that, telling cool stories about the ocean, getting people excited, engaged, because 70% of our planet is ocean, but the vast majority of people just don't know much about it. Uh, most people will know things about Mars, but they don't know what's at their doorstep. People will see the ocean as a big blue tank of water, but they won't take a minute to lift the lid, a lid up and look in where there's this whole magical kingdom. And that's the excitement and the sort of excitement that I want to bring to everyone through sort of the education angle, so awareness. Course. As a child, what triggered your mind to want to get into that tank of water? Okay, so um, a few things. Uh, one was uh, National Geographic magazines. My parents used to bring them home second hand. I used to flip through and I would see all these people and I would think I want to go where no one else will ever go and see things that no one else will ever see. And that was kind of what first drew me in and I was thinking, wow, look at this amazing space. And then I used to go to the museum. I used to have puppetry classes there. I don't remember my puppetry class at all, but they, you know, we had the big blue, skele blue, blue whale skeleton there hanging yeah. from the ceiling. Yeah. And I would spend hours just lying under it and I would think, wow, like what is this giant? And like, what does it look like with its clothes on, right? Because it's just a skeleton. And then I also had the privilege of, as a swimmer, I used to go to Otters and at the time, Sir Arthur C. Clarke used to come there and he used to tell stories of his ocean adventures. And mm -hmm. so one particular time, this one story that I always think about and that I remember the best, was uh, he said he was on a dive and um, this brown skin went past and I was like what was it and he said it was big and I was like okay and he goes it was what it was big okay and he said I said okay and then he goes and he kept going and going it was a big brown skin and I was like wow so what was it and he says I don't know because I had to come back up my dive was over and I was like what and like today like when I think back I think was that something he really saw or was he just trying to spike the imagination of a child, right? And uh, whatever it was, it worked. Because I was like, I want to know what that big blue, big brown skin was. Uh, I still don't know. But uh, it's taken me on some incredible adventures. And then I fell in love with water. And I just, you know, for me, I wanted to marry science and adventure. And marine biology just seemed like such a natural part. So here I am today. Any child out there who wants to follow in your footsteps? What would you say to him or her? So, I, my fundamental advice is always, you know, find what you love and never give up on it, you know, because life is full of challenges, but the most important thing you should know is challenges are things you can climb over or walk around. So, there is never such a big wall that you can never, ever, ever, ever scale it or get to the other side. Challenges are what make life interesting. So, if my path had been, I woke up one day, I went to school, I started to be a marine biologist and I got a job, nobody would want to hear my story. It's way more interesting when I tell you that I was actually a potato farmer at one point. I dug rotting potatoes out of potato fields. I lived in a tent for six months in New Zealand. I persisted and went through all these different challenges to be where I am today. And I, to me, it's just, just persist. Work hard, persist, follow that dream, listen to the advice of other people, process it, remember it's your own life and follow your own dream. Inside that tank of blue water, of water, what do you feel? Your mind, your, your entire being, what happens to you? Uh, so, when I go diving, uh, I mean, I love it because it's just peaceful, right? Um, you're in a space where most people will never get to spend time. It's colourful. There's living, breathing organisms all over the place that most people don't know about and you desperately want them to know about it. It's meditative almost um, and my friends love it because it's the only time I can't actually talk so they're quite happy <laughs> but I'm good at sign language so it's oh, all cool. <laughs> you cannot talk. They're like ah she's silent for like three minutes and then I'm like hand signals like okay here we go. <laughs> That's right. Uh, what about the fear of sharks, the fear of, the fear of being underwater, the dangers uh, of underwater? So I, I don't know I guess I don't really, I don't fear it more than walking on Gaul Road. I mean, oh. frankly, I think Gold Road is more dangerous with those buses and trichos and all the chaos that goes on. When I'm in the ocean, I just, I, you know, the thing is this, I know that when I'm in the ocean, I'm in the home of all these animals. So I'm a visitor, right? 
So if a shark or a, uh, a whatever species comes, a shark, then it's his it's home, and I am there. And but you're his food, then. Well, not necessarily. Sharks don't necessarily eat people. It's a mistaken identity thing where they take a bite and then they're like, "Oh, actually, you're not a seal. You're not tasty. I don't want you." And uh, oh. it's not, you know, yeah, exactly. So um, it's one of those things where actually there's more people will die on Gold Road than ever get, you know, even even see a shark, let alone get eaten by a shark or bit by a shark. So they're not dangerous. They're not looking to come and hunt you. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, perhaps sometimes, uh, but. Uh, the understanding is that you're going to their their home, so it's up to them, really. Your 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 work and your journey in this field of study. How much more do you need to go? Oh gosh, I mean, I when I die, there'll still be tons more to do. Um, like the ocean is a huge space, and it needs every single one of us to protect it. Uh, the ocean is a common property, right? It's a common resource. So every single person in this space right now has the obligation to look after it, has a responsibility, but most people don't. Uh, so I'm taking the burden of everybody else. I'm one of the few people who's willing to take the burden of everyone else to make sure that it's a safe space that is protected. I mean, 50 to 70% of the oxygen that you and I breathe or any of us breathe is produced in the oceans. So the more we deteriorate our oceans, it's, more de it's detrimental to us. And that understanding is something I want more people to have. Uh, so we can start to be more responsible and caring for these Pollution pieces. of the ocean. Pollution is a big problem. Yeah, I mean, when we are out there, we do see plastics, but then oftentimes you don't even see the plastics because they break down into what we call microplastics, which are these tiny, tiny fragments that are so small that you can't see them with the naked eye. But they are in your fish, they are in your salt, they are in everything we consume oh, today. So we eat plastic, okay? Yeah, oh. they've found in studies, say in the UK for example, they found that a third of the fish in the supermarkets actually had microplastics in their stomachs. So you might think, okay, you take the stomach out, it's all cool, but it's not because the plastic, the chemicals in the plastic leaches into the flesh of the fish, which is what you and I will eat. So the more we are careless about the rubbish we dump, easy to use, you know, easy to forget because you aren't looking at it, um, that stuff's going to come back to us. And so even if you don't care about the oceans or the environment, think about the health implications for yourself and because of selfish reasons, start to change your lifestyle. Now, you consciously today did not have a plastic stirrer nor a straw. Yeah. So if everyone does that, it all collects, right? Yeah, it starts to make a difference. So I think, you know, uh, the, what we have to do to address this problem is really stop it at the source. So the more we say no to, then the, obviously there's the market drops, which means there's no need to produce these things. And Supermarkets, these are simple steps. number one. Okay? Yeah, I mean, plastic, plastic bags, bags. Every, every fruit wrapped up, Easy or every, bag, yes. like you get like sometimes like, like bananas will be like plastic wrapped, and you're like bananas are like naturally wrapped up in their own little skin. They're quite comfortable, thanks. But uh, yeah, I don't know why, why we are so obsessed with plastic, but there you go. We can make changes. Very easily. Should we talk of deforestation on land? What's the equivalent down there? So, so one thing is, you know, when you talk about deforestation, most people will be like, oh no, that sounds horrible because you can imagine a forest that existed and then the trees got cut down because we've all kind of, at some point or other, spent time in a forest or in a place with lots of trees. That's the unfortunate thing for the oceans. Most people haven't been into these spaces. And we, for people who have been, Going for years, we see coral reefs that have been destroyed because of rising sea temperatures. We see reefs that have been destroyed because of dynamite fishing, people throwing dynamite into the water to blast the fish so they can get a bigger haul. But that destroys everything else. We see, um, you know, we see basically entire ecosystems wiped out by trawl fishing that drags across the bottom of the ocean floor. That is what it looks like. But because you haven't seen it, it's hard for us to visualize. And that's a challenge for an a marine conservationist. It's like, how do I communicate this to you? How do I make you feel? How you do you don't engage? see these things exactly. as It's like, how do I make you engage with it and feel that same kind of empathy that you may or may not feel when you think about a forest that's been deforested? Um, so I think uh, it's, it's a big challenge, but it's something, that's the kind of stuff that I challenge myself to do better. What is your ultimate dream? My last question. In this chosen field of study. So for me, it's an, my big audacious dream, which I think everyone should have, is that Everyone on this planet will talk about the oceans at least once a day. And that is where I want to go with my life. How far have you 
progressed in this field. I mean, you know, I think now at least Sri Lankans are more excited about the oceans than they ever were before. Because That's because Asha divorce popped up. Well, okay, if there was no Asha divorce, and I'm not flattering you for nothing. No, no, If you no. hadn't popped up with all these awards and all this stuff you've got. But that's because, I, so for me, it's like something that I thrive. I thrive on that excitement of having people be excited and know about the oceans. So Asha Divas is going to keep going. Yeah, we just watch the space. I'm still going. young yeah, enough yeah. to keep, 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 keep going. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I feel like I've made progress. And I, yeah. I, I believe that, you know, I can achieve dreams no matter how far and how big they are. So I believe in myself, which means I believe, believe I can. You heard her. So... Next sequence coming.